Let's take our Bibles now and turn to Paul's first epistle to Timothy, chapter three. And today I'll be reading verses one to seven of First Timothy, chapter three. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent nor greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you now for uh, the time in the week and in this day, the Lord's day and the morning worship in which we open up the Holy Scriptures to hear, to seek, to understand what Christ through his apostle has communicated to us. And we desire to understand these things properly, not that we might just have something to boast in our knowledge, but that we might also, by your grace and with your help, put them into practice. So hear our cries as we look up to you. We pray for the ministry and the presence and the influences and power of your Holy Spirit as your word is preached today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, if you've been with us, we've been studying Paul's first epistle to Timothy. We return to that today and Uh, we've arrived at a very important part of the letter. Here the Apostle Paul is setting forth the qualifications for the office of bishop uh, slash elder slash pastor. And I say it that way because as you study the New Testament, you'll find that the terms elder, pastor, and bishop are used interchangeably in the New Testament to speak of the same office. The same terms are used to refer to the same people. For example, in Acts chapter 20, we read where Paul gathers together the, what, what the text says, uh, the elders of the church in Ephesus, and then in his address to them that follows, he also calls them bishops or overseers, and they are also exhorted to there to shepherd or to pastor the flock. And, and then we also see all three terms used interchangeably of the same office in 1 Peter chapter 5, one to three, and and this is confirmed when you compare our passage this morning to the parallel passage in Titus chapter one. For example, in that passage, Paul exhorts Titus to appoint elders, and then he goes on to say, for a bishop must be blameless, and so on. So in the New Testament, bishop, pastor, elder in the church are three names for the same office, each emphasizing different aspects of it. And so here in our passage, Paul lays out for us the qualifications necessary to serve in this office. But before we begin to look at them today, there there are a number of uh, introductory observations that I'd like to make, some things that are right on the surface of the text by just reading the text itself and what it's about. And first of all, we are reminded here that God intends for a church to have pastors. In church history, there have been two extremes when it comes to this that we must avoid. One is what we might call hyper-clericalism. By that I mean an attitude or practice in which all of the ministry of the church is left up to the pastors. A kind of unspoken assumption that the pastors are to do everything. Members are just to show up and to be served. Or the ordinary Christian is not capable or expected to engage in various forms of ministry in the church. But as most of you know, uh, the scriptures teach that God has given gifts to all of his people, and every Christian is to be involved in in service, ministry, 
Every Christian is responsible to serve the Lord and to find his or her niche of service in and to and through the body of Christ. But then there's another extreme. As a reaction against that, some have gone to the opposite extreme of a kind of anti-clericalism, denying that there are any distinctions of rank and office in the church at all. For example, you'll find this in some forms of what is called brethrenism, uh, brethren churches, or, and there's even a church in our own area that we had some interaction with as officers uh, about some property, and that particular church operates in that way. They don't believe that the church should have officers, in a sense, we're all ministers. And also, this is just a notion that some people seem to have. There are not to be certain men who are office bearers in the church or men who are set apart as authorized ministers of the word and overseers of the church. Now, all these distinctions are artificial, they say. We are all ministers. All of God's people are ministers. But these distinctions are not artificial. It is true in one sense that all of God's people are ministers, but not in the sense that there is no such thing as a distinct class of men set apart from the rest of God's people as official ministers of the word and as overseers and shepherds of the church. And the passage before us makes this very clear that God intends for churches to have pastors. And as we'll see later, God willing in the New Testament, ordinarily to have more than one, to have a plurality of of elders, and it's not a healthy situation when they don't. But then a, a second observation that we can take just from right off the, the reading of the text here is that even more important is the character and the quality of those who serve in this office, as that's really what the emphasis of this passage is. Every church needs pastors, but not just anyone is to be placed into that office, only those men who are qualified. It's better to have no pastors than to have unqualified ones because one of the things that we see in Scripture is that the quality of the leadership of God's people will have a tremendous influence upon the character and the, uh, the, uh, the, the lives of God's people themselves, either for good or for bad. First of all, negatively, unqualified or ungodly leadership will have a negative influence. And there are many examples uh, that could be given. But one glaring illustration of this is the story in the Bible of the northern kingdom of Israel. You may remember that after the death of Solomon, the kingdom was divided into two separate nations, the kingdom of Judah in the south under the rule of the continued Davidic line and the kingdom of Israel in the north. And the first king of the northern kingdom was a man named Jeroboam, Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Well, in organizing the corporate religious life of the northern kingdom, we're told that Jeroboam made Israel to sin. And what he did was, in order to keep the people from going to Jerusalem to worship, which is back down in the southern kingdom, he set up golden calves in Bethel and Dan, and he commanded the people to worship there. And he also appointed priests who were not of the tribe of Levi in violation of God's law, and he ordained a religious festival or religious feast God had not appointed during a month God had not appointed as the scripture says quote even in the month which he had devised of his own heart well eventually many years many kings later judgment came upon the northern kingdom and it was destroyed by the armies of Assyria and the old testament keeps coming back to this as you read through the narrative over and over that this judgment was related to the initial sin of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And again, this is many years later, but it was the result of the way their corporate life had been established under his leadership, which set the pattern that they continued to follow until the end when God's judgment fell upon them. And one might argue that selecting Jeroboam as their king was the worst thing the nation of Israel ever did. And over and over, maybe you've noticed this as you're reading through First and Second Kings, references made back to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, quote, who made my people Israel to sin. It may say something about a king, such and such did this and did this and did this, but he did not remove the calves of Bethel and Dan, and, and he continued in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made my people Israel to sin. That's the negative side of the principle. But there's also the positive. Positively qualified 
godly leadership of the people of God is one of the keys to great blessing. And there are many examples here as well in Scripture. I'll just limit myself to one major example. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 31, we read this, that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. Moses and Joshua and the elders put into place by them started the nation out on a sound and biblical footing. They had established biblical principles and the people followed them as long as Joshua was alive. And as long as those elders who were with Joshua and stood with Joshua and continued to apply those principles were still alive. As long as these godly elders lived and led the nation, the people of God followed the Lord. And God blessed them. But when other elders came who did not follow God's word, the people also were led astray. So we see that this principle has both a negative and a positive side to it. There are exceptions. Sometimes leaders may be godly, but the people reject their leadership. Sometimes even when the leaders may not be qualified and even eventually have to be removed from leadership, the people themselves may still do right. But generally speaking, as it is with the leaders of God's people, so it will be to some degree with the people. The people will to some degree reflect the character, the emphasis, the convictions, the principles that are communicated and lived out by their leaders. Therefore, This matter of only putting men into the office of elder who meet the biblical qualifications is extremely important. Thirdly, again, just some opening observations. Obviously, we're not going to deal with this whole passage today, just barely get into it. But the second observation, we need to realize that the qualifications given for the office of elder or pastor are non-negotiable. It must be upheld whatever the cost. These qualifications are not suggestions. They are not mere ideals. They're not set forth as qualifications for those who are already in office to strive after. These are biblical mandates and directives from Jesus Christ, the head of the church, through his apostle. And rather than goals for those already in office to pursue, no one is to ever be put into office who does not already meet these qualifications. And here in the Greek text, we have what is called the particle of necessity. It's the word day, and it's translated in our text by the word must, must. Verse 2, a bishop then must be. And that word refers to an urgent, absolute necessity. The bishop must be, not should be, not ought to be, not we hope he will eventually become, not merely that he should strive to become. No, the bishop must be. And he must be prior to being placed into office, and he must continue to be so long as he holds the office. I want to borrow an illustration Here, I think it can help us to get the idea. Let's imagine the army has appointed an officer to supervise the enlistment of recruits from the state of Florida. And that officer appoints a sergeant under him in each of the major cities in the state to be in charge of recruiting hand-picked men to form an elite corps in a special branch of the armed services. So the orders come down that the qualifications for this elite group And the only men to be enlisted are men who are at least six feet tall and not over six feet two. At the same time, uh, at the time of their enlistment, they must be no younger than 25 years old and no older than 30. They must have at least a BS or a BA degree. They must have at least two years experience in some form of regular employment. They must be able to run the mile under six minutes and the 100-yard dash under 11 seconds, all right? So these are the qualifications. So when the actual time of recruiting takes place, what would happen if the sergeant produces a man and he runs the mile in five minutes? Man, that's, that's really good. He runs the 100-yard dash in 10.5 seconds. He has two years experience in regular employment. He has a BS degree. He's 26 years old. He meets all of these other qualifications, but he's only five foot two. 
Well, the superior officer says, hey, what's this guy doing here? The sergeant says, well, let's be reasonable. Surely nine out of ten is enough. He fully meets all the other qualifications. What's the big deal? His superior says, listen, sergeant, we're not talking about what you consider to be reasonable. You were given orders. And the orders were, here are the non-negotiable qualifications required for being part of this elite group. We didn't say anything about the color of his eyes. Nothing about the color of his hair or whatever. But we did say, he must be at least six feet tall. What are you doing bringing this guy here? He's only five foot two. You have no authority to make laws around here or to bend them to suit what you think is unreasonable. I remember my football coach, he would say, we don't pay you to think. You know, some guys say, well, coach, I thought we don't pay you to think. You just do what you're told, right? The rules come down from higher level authorities in this army, and your duty is to do what you're told. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, do you see the obvious parallel here? Christ the king, the head of the church, has said through his appointed apostle that the bishop, the pastor, elders must be. And we have no right to take one of these qualifications and say, well, if we hit 9 out of 10, that ought to be good enough. That's reasonable. 90% is good on a report card, isn't it? No, brothers and sisters, we're not talking about a report card. We're talking about discerning, which is partly not only the responsibility of the existing elders, but of the congregation as a whole, discerning and determining whether or not God has called and qualified a man to serve in the office of elder in his church. Now, of course, and I think this is important, as we're going to see, there's a certain degree of subjectivity involved in discerning and applying these qualifications to persons. It's not exactly like the illustration I just gave. I mean, the qualifications for this elite army corps are very objective. I mean, you can easily, you can objectively measure whether a person is at least, at least six feet tall uh, and less than six feet two. You can objectively, conclusively measure with a stopwatch how fast he can run the 100-yard dash. But the qualifications that Paul gives to us here are not as objective as that. Some more than others, but generally speaking, they are more subjective. They're more general, more like a sketch, more like an impressionistic style painting than a personal photograph. And therefore, of necessity, we have to wrestle with these things prayerfully and charitably and reasonably. And the church has to make informed judgments. It's not like plugging in a computer program and out pops the right answer. Yes, this guy is, is qualified. But still, not one of these qualifications is to be ignored in our consideration of a man. And this leads to a fourth introductory observation. We also need to realize that all who are qualified in every area mentioned in this passage may not be equally qualified. And this is very important. Some may be stronger in one area and some in another, though all must meet all the qualifications, at least to some observable and obvious degree. Going back to the illustration, all had to run the mile in at least six minutes. Well, some who qualified may run it in four minutes and 50 seconds. Some may run it in five minutes and 30 seconds. And this one guy, he just made it in in six minutes. But they're still qualified. They had to run the 100-yard dash in at least 11 seconds. One guy ran it in nine flat. Another just got in at 11, but both are qualified. In the same way, some elders may be extremely qualified, exceptionally qualified men, while others are adequately qualified to serve as elders in the church. In terms of giftedness, some may be five talent guys, while others are two talent guys. So while we must not settle for less than what Christ requires, it is just as important that we must be careful not to require more than Christ requires. Now, I would say in general evangelicalism, the first issue is the main problem and danger, settling for less than what God requires. While I would tend to think that among Reformed Baptists in general, we can tend toward the other extreme, and that is requiring more than what Christ requires. And so we have to be careful of both of these extremes, and both of these are important. And that leads to a a fifth preliminary principle by way of introduction. 
we must remember this, <clears throat> that when Christ does give to a man the qualifications for the office, it is the church's duty to recognize and to receive that man as an elder in the church. You see, there are two sides to the conferral of the office of elder. First, there is the church's side, and that involves two things. The church's recognition and reception of the man, and the willingness of existing elders with good conscience to confirm that by laying their hands upon the men, what we call election and ordination, okay? That's the church's side. But above that, and prior to that, there's the divine side. There is Christ's making and giving of the man. You see, the church does not give to itself elders. The church does not form them. The church does not make them. The church has the duty to examine and to recognize and to receive those Christ has given and Christ has made. Those upon, upon whom Christ has placed his hand. He's given us a blueprint. He said, look for men like this. When you see men like that, these are men I've given to your church to be elders. We're told in Ephesians 4.11 that Christ, the head of the church, gives to his church men who have the gifts and graces to be pastors and teachers. Ephesians 4, 8 and following, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Verse 11, and he gave some pastors and teachers. We're told in Acts 20, 28, that the Holy Spirit makes men overseers. Acts 20, 28, Paul's, you remember he's gathered the elders from the church at Ephesus, he's speaking to them, and he says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You see, the church doesn't give them. The church doesn't make them rightful overseers and shepherds of the flock. That's the work of God the Son by the Spirit. The duty of the church is to recognize those Christ has given and to receive those Christ has given and Christ has qualified. And for the church to refuse to do that is in fact an act of rebellion against the authority of Christ in his church. So you see, this works both ways. On the one hand, a church is wrong who puts men into office who clearly do not meet the qualifications set forth in Scripture. But on the other hand, a church is in the wrong when it does not recognize and receive those who do, those whom Christ has indeed given. So there should be a certain sense of holy reverence and trepidation when it comes to the church considering men. It's not a cavalier thing because we're, we're seeking to discern what Christ is doing and who Christ has given to the church, right? And we don't want to expect more than Christ does and we don't want to expect less than Christ does. Now, it's very important we understand this. Electing and ordaining elders is not a popularity contest. It's not a matter of personality preferences, which have nothing to do with scriptural principle or qualification. It's not a matter of whether or not you like the way a man parts his hair or whether or not you like his style his natural temperament or personality is not a matter of whether you wish he were older than you instead of younger than you or younger than you instead of older than you or whether you wish he were the same age as you. The question we must ask is, does he meet the qualifications? Our Lord sets forth in his word, and if he does, we are obligated to receive him as a gift from Christ, and we're not to make up and we're not to require qualifications that Christ himself has not given. Well, after this somewhat lengthy, I guess you could call introduction, we're ready now to begin to consider the qualifications for the office of elder. And I want to look at this carefully. We're going to spend time on some of these things because I think it's very timely that we've come to this at this time in the life of our congregation. Our church is growing uh, with that, there's a need for more elders, and we need to be able to 
to have a clear understanding of what we are to be looking for in men that would be put into that office as we pray, pray that God would continue to give us men to serve in that office. And then also, as you know, Reformed Baptist Seminary is one of the ministries of our church. We have the residential arm of the seminary here, and we have many seminary students in our congregation. And this is a time timely for them to examine themselves and to see, hey, where am I weak here? Where's, where's an area that I need to work on in order to be qualified? It's not just... You're not qualified just because you finish your studies, right? Paul doesn't really say, that I don't see in here a qualification uh, if a man has finished his seminary degree. I don't see that in there. But the emphasis is on his character, isn't it? Now, he's to be apt to teach. He's to be a man who's been trained. He understands how to teach sound doctrine. But the emphasis is upon character. So it's, this is a good timing for all of our men to, as we work our way through this and for us as a church together. So it's very timely. What are the qualifications God lays out before us here in our text? Well, obviously we're not going to finish them today. We're just going to get started. And the first qualification is this, what I would call a pressing desire for the office and its work. Look at verse 1. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And we have two very strong Greek words that are translated desire here. There's two different words, but both are translated desires. If a man desire the position, he desires a good work. And the first word translated desire literally means to stretch oneself out after to reach out after something. The other word translated desires is a different Greek word, but it has a similar meaning. It's used to describe a, a passionate compulsion, a longing after something. It's the same word, in fact, Jesus used in Matthew 5, 5.28 when he said that whoever looks upon a woman to lust, that's the word, after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. But of course, here the word is being used in a positive way. So we see that two very strong words are used here, which are basically synonymous, with the only distinction possibly being that one may be referring to the active pursuit of something, reaching out after something, and the other to the inward uh, longing, desire for something. So we could paraphrase 1 Timothy 3, 1 in this way. If a man reach after, pursue, stretch himself out after the office of bishop, he longs, he desires after a good work. So Paul, in giving the qualifications for the office of pastor, begins with the assumption that those being considered, or those considering the office, have a pressing desire for it. But notice in what sense, or for what reason, they have a pressing desire for it. Is a desire uh, rising out of or consisting of an ambition for position, for rank and position? A desire to be looked up to and praised by men? A desire to have power and control in the church? Or is it a desire based on the, the mistaken idea that the ministerial life is a life of ease, an easy way to make a living? No. If a man desire the office of bishop, he desires a good work, Paul says. See, a man may have a pressing desire for the office because he's ambitious and because he, he has an improperly high view of himself. He's ambitious for position and rank or notoriety or he thinks more highly of himself than he ought to think or for some other carnal reason, but that's not the kind of desire the apostle is talking about. He's not talking about a sinful desire, but a desire for the work of the office of bishop not just the office, a desire to give oneself in serving Christ and the church and the cause of the gospel in the context of carrying out all the difficult duties and responsibilities involved in holding this office. <clears throat> we could break them down as pastors, uh, pastors are shepherds, they're, they're, they're overseers, they're teachers and preachers where there's the work of shepherding the flock of God which involves taking heed to the flock, feeding the flock, protecting the flock, healing the flock. There's the work of overseeing the church, which involves implementing the directives of Christ in the church. 
presiding over and directing the affairs of the church and establishing and enforcing the policies of the church. And then there's the teaching of the people of God, which if properly done, requires many hours of diligent, painstaking labor in the study of the scriptures. All of this and more is involved in the good work referred to in our text. And when God puts his hand on a man and fits him for the office, he gives him a pressing desire. I, 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 I wouldn't say 100% I agree with it, but in large part, I agree with what Spurgeon said. If you can do anything else, don't be a pastor. Because if God's called you, that pressing desire will overcome every other desire. It'll be a pressing desire. God gives him a desire, but not only for the office, but for the work of the office. A desire to spend and to be spent, to give his life. I love thy church, O God. For her my prayers ascend, for her my toils and cares be give, till toils and cares shall end. There's that, that desire, desire to spend, to be spent in the labors and the duties of the pastoral office in loving service to Christ and his people in seeking to advance the cause of the gospel. Now this is not to deny that this desire may be fought against and wrestled with for a time. A man God has purpose for the office may draw back from the very idea of it for a time out of a humble distrust of himself and out of a trembling sense of how weighty this calling is. In fact, I'm more suspect of the guy who thinks, why is everyone not recognizing me? Why am I not a pastor? I can tell you that wasn't my spirit. I'm not saying that I'm perfect or anything like that, but I was scared to death to become a pastor. My wife can tell you. I went through agonizings of soul over this and so it's, it is a troubling thing to me to see when I see a guy who just thinks man I can, obviously I should be a pastor why is everyone else not recognizing oh there's it's, it's a healthy thing for there to be a, a distrust of yourself to, a trembling sense of how weighty this call is and that may sometimes cause a man to, to, to draw back for a time or even there can be a sinful reluctance or a cowardly fear but if a man is truly called of God I would argue that this Holy Spirit given pressure this desire will eventually prevail and overcome that reluctance so that no one is to be put into the office against their will and who has no desire for it. There have been some odd things that have happened in church history, though I will say this. When Ambrose was called into the ministry, it was because all of a sudden the people just started shouting they wanted Ambrose to be their bishop. He had no interest or desire at that time. But it was so obvious to the people themselves that this man was qualified and gifted and that overcame. His reluctance was eventually over, overcome. So there are, there are oddities that happen at times. But generally speaking, no one should be put into the office against their will. Who has no desire for it. Now this element of a pressing desire for the office and its work is, I think, seen even more clearly over at 1 Peter chapter 5. If you want to turn over there, just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of the glory of Christ, the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd, or you could translate pastor. So these are elders. They're told to pastor the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. That's the word translated back in our text, bishop. So there you see all three terms used for the same office. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So here we see that true biblical a God-approved elder takes on the work of the office, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not with an eye to dishonest gain, but eagerly. With a readiness and an eagerness for the work. Willingness and readiness of mind are required of those who hold the office. So the first qualification for the office is that a man must be willing to accept it. And there must be a pressing 
desire for the office and its duties. The office and its duties. And brothers and sisters, in my seminary days, and in the over 34 years now that I've been a pastor, I've seen many who appeared to have a strong desire for the office of pastor, but not a strong desire for the work involved in properly fulfilling that office. Men who loved all of those aspects of the office that put them up in front of people and drew out the praises of men, but who despised or neglected the hard work of shepherding and governing the flock that often goes on behind the scenes. All they want to do is strut their stuff behind a pulpit, not interested in the headaches of administration and the labors of pastoral care and shepherding, and sometimes not even interested in really doing the labor to study to prepare good sermons. I just want to get up there and show people what I can do. Just let me preach. Well, there's nothing necessarily wrong with the desire to preach. Would to God that he would raise up more who have the desire and the ability and the giftedness to preach. But when that desire is divorced from a readiness to give yourself in service to God's people in all of the other less glamorous aspects of the pastoral office, there's good reason to doubt whether that desire is truly a gracious God-given desire. In fact, there's good reason to suspect it is a carnal desire arising from selfish ambition. And let me add that here we find a good test for the church to apply to any man who has aspirations for the office of elder, as well as a good test for such men to apply to themselves. If that desire is of the right kind, that is, if it is a desire arising out of a heart that sincerely loves Christ and his truth and truly loves his people, a heart that longs to serve Christ and his people and has a burden for the spread of the gospel, the man with that kind of desire will be giving himself in service to his Christ and to his church now in whatever ways are consistent with his current station in life and his current opportunities. Becoming an elder will not suddenly make a man into something that he is not. It will not suddenly make a man into a zealous, active servant of Christ in the church. No, he must evidence himself to be such before he is ever put into the office. So we've seen that the first qualification for the office of elder is a pressing desire for the office and its work. But a pressing desire is not enough either. A man may have a strong desire, and that desire may be of the right kind, a desire for the work, a good desire that truly comes from a heart that loves Christ and the church and a servant's heart, an evangelistic heart, a heart that loves souls. But that still doesn't prove that Christ is setting that man apart for the office of elder in the church. That must be there. But then there is a list of qualifications that must be met. Now you'll notice that heading up this entire list is a kind of umbrella qualification, we might call it, which is then spelled out in more detail. That umbrella qualification is he must be blameless. More specifically, he must be blameless then in all of these areas that are listed after that below. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And then the apostle begins the qualifications in in uh, verse 2 with this kind of general overall statement, a bishop then must be blameless. He begins in Titus 1 in the same way with these words, if a man is blameless. Two different Greek words are used in these two passages and both are translated by the English word blameless. And their meanings are very similar. One carries the idea of having nothing laid to one's charge, justly laid to one's charge, or unaccused, and the other means unaccusable. They're, they're basically synonyms with the di- this difference. One emphasizes freedom from any legitimate, any just charge against you in any of these areas as, as having a character flaw in any of these areas mentioned. The other emphasizes freedom from any just reason, legitimate reason for being charged. 
And the major idea in both words is that of being irreproachable, not justly censured, not engaging in behavior or having a character that could be justly censured in the church or charged with these things, not open to being justly censured or charged. Now, a couple of comments to help us better understand what is meant by this and what is not. First, in both texts, the verb is in the present tense. He must be blameless. Or if a man is blameless, the Titus text. The reference is to a present state of proven blamelessness in these areas that are going to be mentioned. It's not referring to the totality of a man's life, either before or after he became a Christian, unless there is still an ongoing problem. Otherwise, no one would ever be qualified. Furthermore, the word does not mean sinless. It doesn't mean that a man's never sinned in any of these areas in any way. No, again, no one would ever be qualified. The word speaks of a present state that's been sustained for a sufficient period of time to put it beyond a reasonable doubt that this is true of this man's character. A present state in which there's nothing for which the man is being justly censured or reproved or for which he could be justly censured or reproved. There's no current behavior pattern. No current behavior pattern that is bringing or could potentially bring reproach upon the office, upon Christ, and upon the church in any of these areas that Paul is about to mention. Now again, this is a kind of umbrella qualification as Paul now begins to spell this out and apply this to specific areas in the man's life. And we're only going to have time to look at the first one. He is irreproachable, first of all, with reference to his marriage. His marriage. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. And let me just ease your mind. There's not going to be a separate sermon on every one of the qualifications. <laughs> but today, because of all the preliminary stuff and preparing the way, we're just going to deal with this one today, okay? God willing, we'll finish the rest of them, I hope, next week. Now, there have been all kinds of interpretations given to what this says about the husband of one wife that I think make it say more than it does. For example, some have argued that this prohibits a single man from serving as an elder, or they've worried that maybe it does. Well, by that standard, even Paul himself uh, would not be qualified. The emphasis of the passage, that's why I took time to emphasize this kind of umbrella command that, over, that overlooks everything that's being said here. The emphasis of this passage is upon insisting that a man be irreproachable. That's the overarching concern, not that a man be married, and there's nothing necessarily reprovable about being single. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul tells us that single, he, he, he holds up singleness as preferable in some cases, and for this reason, it gives greater freedom for a person to give more focused attention to things most directly related to the Lord's service. So singleness is not in any way a reprovable state. It doesn't render a man liable to just reproof. And so it's not to say that a single man cannot be an elder. He can. What we have here is Paul, is Paul is simply assuming that most elders will be married. And if in fact they are, this is to be the situation. In order to be irreproachable, they must be the husband of one wife. Now others have interpreted this then is forbidding any man from holding the office who has ever been divorced or remarried under any circumstances. Now, it might surprise some of you for me to say that I disagree with that. I would simply remind you that a man who has been divorced or remarried is not necessarily in a reprovable state. He may be in a present, sustained state of blamelessness. And remember, though divorce is inevitably the result of sin, it's not always a sin to be divorced. And now I have time to open this up in detail right now, but the historic Protestant and Reformed position, and I agree with it, is that the Bible allows for divorce and remarriage under certain circumstances. One, if your spouse is sexually unfaithful to you, Matthew 5, 32, 19, 9, or two, if your spouse sinfully deserts you, or is sinfully no longer pleased to dwell with you any longer, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And these matters have to be worked out in the church. 
Sadly, they often aren't, but they need to be. Because they aren't, sometimes innocent people have their name kind of sullied because no one really knows what happened, and that's not a good thing. They need to be worked out in the discipline proceedings of the church or in the, uh, the proceedings of the church in general and so on. But the point is, having been divorced at some time does not necessarily mean that a man is not irreproachable. And let me just add that a position that forbids any divorced man under any circumstances from ever holding office in the church simply cannot be proven from this text. The text does not say a bishop must be a man who has never been divorced. Or a bishop must be a man who's been married only once. It simply says he must be the husband of one wife, or literally, a one-woman man. And there's nothing said here about divorce or remarriage. We have to go elsewhere to find the Bible's teaching on that subject. Now, the next two interpretations are more plausible. I believe the second one is the real point of the text, but the first one could be included. First of all, some have taken this to be a prohibition against polygamists holding the office. In other words, no man should be put into the office who is presently married to more than one woman. Now, I don't know why any man would want to be married to more than one woman, but but I'm just kidding. (laughs) If they were all like my wife, it'd be be great, right? But I, I think, but some, obviously polygamy has been practiced at different times in history, and some say, well, that's what's being said here. Now, there are reputable commentators who interpret this in that way, and I would agree that what Paul says here, in effect, does forbid a man who has more than one wife from holding the office. But there are several reasons that I'm convinced there's more to it than what's being said here. Number one, the words translated husband and wife are the generic terms in the Bible for man and woman. Now, they're also sometimes used interchangeably, used specifically to refer to a husband and a wife, but more often, they simply refer to a man or a woman, and the context has to make the determination. So there's a judgment call that has to be made in the, how you translate it. Literally, what Paul says here could be translated one woman man, or more literally, of one woman man. The Greek text is one wife husband or one woman man. It can be translated either way. Now it seems clear to me that Paul's great concern in this text is not so much with an elder's marital status, because an elder doesn't even have to be married, but the concern here is that an elder who is married must be a one woman man. He's concerned with his character. He must be faithful and devoted to his one wife. And this is further supported by the absence of the article the in the Greek text. Paul could have said the husband of one wife, as it's translated here, but or the man of one woman, which it would seem indeed to emphasize marital status, but in, in the Greek text there's no article. In the absence of the article, the seems to put the stress upon character upon the quality of the marriage, not merely upon marital status. And then I would also remind you, again, that the whole emphasis of this passage is upon blamelessness, being above just reproach and censure in this area. Well, a man can be married to just one woman and still not be above reproach in the area of his marriage. So for these reasons, I'm convinced it's wrong to view this merely as a reference to a person's marital status Now, certainly a a one-woman man could not be a polygamist. He can't have more than one wife, yes, but the point of the text is that an elder must be devoted to his one wife, his one woman, his wife. In other words, his commitment to his wife, his faithfulness to his wife must be above reproach. Must be above reproach. This man loves his wife, is devoted to his wife, is faithful to his one woman. And that faithfulness to his wife is above reproach. That's my understanding of the text. Well, I could spend more time on that, but our time is almost gone. I'll have to come back to this next time. But let me just ask you this question. Why is all of this important? Why is Paul concerned that the church have the right kind of men who are leading it? Well, it's because Paul is concerned about the gospel. He's concerned about 
world evangelization and mission. You remember, that's how this whole section begins. Don't, get conf- don't, get, don't miss that because of the chapter divisions. This is where the whole section begins in this epistle. You remember up at the beginning of chapter 2. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Chapter 2, verse 4. And that's why Paul goes on. That's one of, the, one of the means by which men and women are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth is through the ministry and the testimony of a healthy church. That's why he's been laying out all of these directives for the church. In fact, the greatest, so what kind of evangelistic programs do you have? Well, I'll say this, the greatest, most effective evangelism program is a healthy church. And you can have all kinds of evangelistic programs in an unhealthy church, and that's not good. It's not going to be effective. A healthy church is a great tool for evangelism because it produces healthy Christians. And healthy Christians love Christ. They love the gospel. That calls them to have a burden for those who are lost, and it becomes a spontaneous thing for the church to be actively involved in evangelism and witnessing to others and have to pray for the cause of Christ and the work of the gospel in the world. You see, the best method of evangelism is a healthy church. Paul knew that. That's the driving concern in his call to prayer, you remember, at the beginning of this chapter. Praying for kings and all those in authority and so on. Followed by his exhortation to the women to dress modestly and his teaching about the roles of men and women in the church. And now here as he lays out the qualifications for those who are to lead the church, Paul is driven by the desire to see Christ glorified in the church. What's that mean, Christ glorified? That the beauty and the glory of Christ would shine forth in the fellowship and life of the church, that men may see what a, glorif- what a glorious Savior he is. That the church might be a mighty force for the advancement of the gospel. That's why we need to be concerned about these things. And my lost friend who is here this morning among us, perhaps you're thinking, why all the fuss about this? Why taking all this time to open this up in detail? Well, one reason we're doing so is because of you. We want you to see the glory of Christ reflected in this church. We want you to see the power of the gospel and what it does to the lives of people in the church and to see it modeled by the pastors of the church because we want you to hear and to believe the gospel and to be saved. We want you to know that there is a Savior for you, a Savior, God the Son, who became man and who died on the cross and there paid the debt that we owe to God's justice for our sins as our substitute upon that cross, that we might be forgiven, that we might be reconciled to God, a Savior who is able and willing to save you, to make you a new person, and who offers himself to you today to be your Savior and who will save you if you receive him by faith. We want you to see how wonderful and how great Jesus really is. And I pray that's true of all of us. That's why we're concerned about the health of the church and about everything that we do in the church, that everything be done in accordance with God's word and with the right spirit and the right heart so that Christ is glorified. And my friend, you need him. You desperately need him if you're outside of Christ this morning, for without him, You'll be lost and damned forever. Well, may God bless his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your holy word. We pray that you would help us as we lay out before us the blueprint, the sketch, the impressionistic painting that Christ has provided for us, that we would be able to identify those that have been given to us to be elders in the church. And also, Lord, to be careful not to place men into those positions who are not qualified. We ask you for wisdom because it is our desire, Christ, that we would follow you and obey you in this area as well as in every area of the life of our church. So we ask this in your holy name. Amen.